to find make flip, which of course I don't have the code for. So flip is supposed to do one the first time it's called. Let value be one. And then it's going to return land of no arguments. You guys recall this sort of, right? Mm -hmm. And the body is going to be Right. Well, what am I going to set the bang the value to? Oh, we need to alternate 0, 1. You guys wrote this. Come on. <laughs> Thinking back. 1 minus x. One minus x. Set bang value minus 1 value. Are we flipping the order here? No, because it's going to either be 1 minus 0 or it's going to be 1 minus 1. So it's either going to turn out to be 1 or 0 depending on what this was. Right? Okay, so and then we're going to return value. So we have a couple of choices here. It says it should return 1 the first time it's called. Right now it's going to return 0 the first time it's called, so the easiest thing to do is that. So this is make flip. Let's make this over here our big environment diagram. With this top box being the global environment. And we're defining, so this is we're defining a procedure, lambda of no parameters with the body of let blah 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 to the name make flip. So here's make flip, which gets bound in our global environment. We have a procedure object. We're evaluating in the global environment right now. The parameters for this procedure are going to be none. There are no parameters. And the body is let value 0, lambda, no parameters, set bang, value, blah, blah, blah. We're going to run out of room, actually. And this gets bound here. Yes? Mm -hmm. Cool. So now we're going to define flip 1 to be a make flip, result of applying make flip. Okay, so we're going to bind flip 1 to the result of that evaluation. So to evaluate make flip, we're applying a procedure, right? We're applying a procedure. We're applying a procedure, therefore we create a new frame. Okay, so that we're all completely consistent in all of our three representations. I will use John's notation here. I can use John Dimitri's <laughs> there. And then mine with E1, therefore combining everybody's representations into one. And you'll chain the arrows together somewhere. Oh, yeah, I was doing the chaining of the arrows too. So this point's here, and we can chain these together. Okay. Okay. Those are all the same things, and we're not going to keep doing them. Okay. But somehow you need to know something was created. So in any case, we've created a box, box because we're applying make flip. It points back to where this arrow points to. Yes? What's like the bare minimum that you need to be able to do? Just drawing the box and the arrow? Drawing the box and the arrow. You don't need anything else. Actually, once you get good at the environment model, you won't do any of that chaining. Because actually, I, I guess of, the, of them all, I like John's the best. John's is writing it above the frame. I like to label the frame because it gives me an evaluation order. And if I need to go back and reconstruct it, I can see in which order I created the frames. 
Um, but his probably makes the most sense in terms of, because once we start dotting and chaining all over the place here, it's going to get even messier than it's bound to get anyway. So we're making a flip procedure. So we create a frame. There are no parameters to bind. Then we evaluate the body. OK, it is a let. A let creates a frame. Frame. Because there is that hidden lambda. So here we could write let. Chains up to the environment we were in. We bind value to be 0. Create a procedure object. Where are we evaluating this lambda? In this E2. E2, so it points up to E2. What are the parameters to this? And the body is set bang value minus 1 value return value. So that's the body. So this is the result of evaluating of applying make flip to no arguments. And that is what's going to get bound to flip one. So there's flip one. And here's the frame, which is basically storing the state for us for flip one. This is where the value is stored. So now you're asked to define flip two. which is also an application of make flip to no parameters, which is going to look very similar. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to create a frame to apply make flip. Make flip points up to the global environment. So too will this frame. There are no parameters to bind. We have a let. Because of the lambda, implicit lambda, let is going to create a frame when that implicit lambda is applied. And we bind the parameter of that implicit lambda, which is value, which gets bound to 0. Then we evaluate this procedure object. Three. In E4. It has no parameters, and its body is set bang value, and it is bound to flip to. Okay. So now we've just evaluated three things: define make flip, define flip one, and define flip two. Because the body here, it's still the, same, it's still the same body, right? So this is two separate applications of make flip. And the body make flips is value zero. Okay, so we let it be zero here, and again we're evaluating it here because it's zero. Okay. And of course, now they change the names of everything on me. So what if we say flip one? So to do flip one, if we're applying flip one to no arguments, well, flip one is this procedure here. To apply it, we need to create a frame, which would be conveniently located perhaps over here. Flip one points here, so that frame will be there. So this is flip one. Okay. There are no parameters, nothing to be bound. Then when we're in this environment, we're going to evaluate set bang value of one minus value. So I'm here in E5, and I have no value in this frame. So I look up. There is a value here, and I get 0. 
So 1 minus 0 is 1. And I'm going to change that to be 1. Then I return the value, which is 1. So this is going to return 1. What if I were to do flip 2? Same thing, except that we're applying this one. So create a frame, which is the evaluation of flip 2. Flip 2 points here. So we'll just frame. This is the sixth frame that we've created. No parameters. Set bang value to be 1 minus value. No value here. We look up. There's a value. It's 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. Change it to 1 and return the value, which is 1. OK. Can you one Why do we need E1 and E3? Hmm? Why do we need E1 and E3? Why do we need E1 and E3? Uh, we don't need them, but they are created. Anytime we apply a procedure, we have to create a frame. Even if there are no parameters passed or bound as a result of evo evaluating that lambda, we need to create that frame. Is E1 and E3 ever going to cause any change in the program? You no environments, I don't know that you could really say that an environment causes anything, and an environment is. An environment is acted upon. It's not the actor. You, couldn't you write that metacircular evaluator to skip that if there's no <coughs> argument? And just not extend the environment in that case if there's no argument? Sure, we could rewrite our language to not create anything if there were no arguments. Yeah, you wouldn't do any harm. It certainly wouldn't do any harm, but we'd have to rewrite the language. A frame is actually created in Scheme when we evaluate it, which is why we represent it here. So actually, now that you guys have seen metacircularity some, maybe the environment diagram makes a little more sense. For, yeah, yeah. right? Because each one of these is a list that John talked to you guys about. So when we're evaluating flip one here, our list, our first list is here, and it's attached to this list, attached to this list, attached to that list. Right? And we just chain up, basically cut her down the list until we find a binding that we're looking for. Maybe. Each frame extends the environment. Right, we extend the environment when we create the new frame. And so the environment gets bigger and bigger. So here, we look up through this stuff here. Here, we look up through this stuff here. So this is basically an empty list, but the environment is represented. And, and hmm? It actually has a physical presence in scheme. Yes, yes, it does have a physical presence, which is why we draw it, because it's actually there. And those frames in the bottom are lost because nothing points to Right. Exactly. These frames have nothing pointing to them, so they're just there. Can't get back to them. So in fact, they would be garbage collected at some point. That stuff that's there would be garbage collected away. Well, yeah, our machines are fast enough that you don't see it. There used to be machines called Lisp machines. They're made by a company called Symbolics, and their machines you would actually see physically. It would pop up going garbage collecting. And you'd see it, and it would sit and pause and do something. It would, it would be clearing its memory out. Because the machine's so much faster now, you don't see that sort of stuff happening. But it used to be, and it would say, sometimes it would say, you're filling up the memory too quickly, and we're about to go into a slow method of garbage collecting. And it would give you no time to respond. It would tell you this about 20 seconds before it actually did it. And then the machine would be locked up for like the next four hours. <laughs> yeah. And when it happens at about 12, 1, then you're like, OK, this is a sign to sleep. And you would go sleep for a few hours. It was after midnight anyway. Um, but this doesn't happen anymore. Um, the machines were probably old in that. I mean, this was, I was doing this in 1990, 1991. Oh, just 10 years ago. Yeah, just 10 years ago. Yeah. So, but the machines are probably a good three, four years older than that. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Um, at what point, if any, would flip line flip through your garbage collection? Well, we would never, as long as basically the way garbage collection works, and I don't want to go <laughs> preview the whole, well, I can preview it, but I don't want to go into the whole lecture for garbage collection. The way garbage collection is going to work is that we go through memory and try to figure out what we can get to. And if we can't get to it somehow, we mark it as being something we can't get to. And then we can get rid of it. 
Right. How do you know it's there? You cannot read yeah. to this thing. Well, because there actually is physical memory in a computer. Right? There's actually some place in the memory, some, some place in the computer, there's some chip that stores bits like a memory. You can think of you know, a disk, a floppy disk stores stuff for you. And what you can do is you can look at your frames, you can look at the global environment and say, what's the stuff I can get to from the global environment? And then you look at, you basically make a little mark next to it. And then you basically scan over your memory, and anything that doesn't have a mark over it means you couldn't get to it, and it's clear, it's gone. Does garbage collection also do some sort of defragmentation? Uh, depends on what you were doing. If you were actually trying to do some cleaning up like that. There are, there are methods that will do that, and there are methods that don't. Okay. We'll talk about that. But all languages have to have this feature. Uh, I mean, certainly somehow you need to get rid of objects that you're not using anymore. Um, we have a lot of list structure and all sorts of stuff that we do have hanging around more. But yeah, certainly you don't want your memory crowded up with stuff. You can free the memory by, just by when you come out of maybe in a C function saying, I'm not going to use this anymore. And it just it's freed up. Do you do it explicitly in C? Did you say no, in C you don't do it explicitly. Well, I mean, you, can, you free it up. There actually is a free command. So if you take some space and you can free it up, and then it can be used later on. Depends on whether you're doing stack or right. Stack is implicit. You always have to do it explicitly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Post. But you have to worry about all that, whether it's in the stack or the heap or whatever. Y you'll know because you'll do it yourself. So. All right. Yeah, if you if you actually create the memory, you need to free it up. So, we'll do garbage collection on Friday. Uh, okay, so we have that. Now we're going to define flap one to be an application of flip one. So here's flip one here. We're going to apply flip one. Unfortunately, running out of board space. So we are now up to E7. And flip one, this is the procedure object. It points to this frame E2. So we are going to go over there. This also is created by an evaluation, an application of flip one. There are no parameters. We're over here in this environment evaluating this. And we're going to set bang the value to be a result of 1 minus value. No value here. Chain up. Value. 1 minus value. 0. Then we return value. We return a 0 from this application. So we're going to define flap 1 to be 0. So flap 1 is not bound to be a procedure object at all. It's just the value that got returned. And then... That's not quite what the handout was doing. Is it the, the handout from Seven was saying flip is the return of make flip. Right, so rather than... So, so the handout here says define flip to be a make flip, define flap 1 to be an application of flip. But, but because... Well, I didn't want to do another flip because we had already done two of them. But, so what? But by so doing, we're returning a zero set of Right, because we've already applied it once. It would have been yeah. one before. Okay. Right. Right. So we've already applied this one, so it's, it's flipped once. So it's not exactly what the answers that you would have gotten for your homework. It's, it's inverted by one. I'm not asking for more frames. I just yeah, I just didn't. I, I looked at this and saw that they were defining flip to be a make flip, and we had already done make flip twice. So it didn't feel like doing it a third time was going to help us that much. Okay, so we are going to define flap two to be uh, are they giving? Yeah. So this is what they say: define flap two to be flip, and they actually do put the parens around it. Flip one or flip two? Oh, flip one. Sorry. Okay. So flap two to be flip one. So let's do this. So flap two is defined to be what? What's flap two? It's a procedure object. Where am I evaluating this? I hear munchkins. 
Did somebody say munchkins? <laughs> create some munchkins. Um, the parameters to this procedure object are what? None. None. And its body? Application flip one, and that gets bound to be flap two. Check. So now, if we apply flap two, what happens? Well, let's go through it. We're applying flap two. Create a frame. Where does flap two point to? Okay. Parameters. What are, what are we up to now? E eight. No parameters. Our body is to apply flip one to no parameters. So we're going to apply flip one. Where does my arrow point to? I hear E8 and E2. Which one? OK, we're applying flip 1. Our body is to apply flip 1. Here, we don't have a flip 1. We look up here. We find flip 2. We come down here. We're applying this procedure object, and it's pointing to E2. So this needs to point to E2. And I intentionally drew it over here to confuse you, because <laughs> uh, I mean. Okay, so now we have E9. We're evaluating this in that frame. There are no parameters to bind. And I'm here, and I'm going to set bang value. No value here. Follow my chain. Value is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. And I return value. So I return 1. So an application of flap 2 is 1. Now, when I apply flip 1 again, I've affected, right? Because I defined flap 2 in terms of flip 1, my next call to flip 1 will be something that I may not expect. Because our last call to flip 1 was a 1, but our next call to flip 1 will also return a 1. Because this application, because flap 2 is effectively changing this value here, this tape. Yeah. And that's where these diagrams start to become really po powerful. This would be something that would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to represent in the substitution model. Questions? Should I continue along this line, or should I do the one from the exam? Can you just uh, trace why it's. Okay, let's do. Let's do a flip one again. OK, flip one is this procedure object here, and I want to apply it. So let's create frame E10, which is going to point over there. No parameters to bind. I'm going to set bang the value. I have no value here. I'll follow my chain up. It's here. I'm going to subtract one from it changing that to 0, and I return 0. Oh, we had already changed it once before, hadn't we? Yeah. OK. Return 0. That's where it returned 1 in here. And here it went back to 0. Yes? So we're affecting this one value here. So this starts to look like the environment diagrams of the game. It starts to get really, really complicated, right? It's not going out. So nothing is connected to the A, I guess. It's just the one being there. Right. So E8 was a frame that we, evalu that we created because we were applying flap 2. So we created the frame, got bound here, but there were no parameters to bind, and its body was an application of flip 1, which is why we created E9. But because we're applying this procedure, 
E9 has to point to the, where that procedure, FLIP1, pointed to. Right? So just very mechanical rules that if I create a, a frame to apply a procedure object, it has my new frame points to where my procedure object points to. You don't look convinced. No, okay. 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 And that's the basic rule. Yeah, just, just rules. Mm -hmm. and because, I mean, it has to be rules because Scheme is actually doing this underneath, like you guys saw with the Metacircular Evaluator. Scheme is doing something very similar to what the Metacircular Evaluator is doing. It's creating these environment frames. So Scheme has code that's running it. It's just following rules, just like we are here. How do people who program in this, like, professionally keep all this in mind? You know, what, what the local environment is when they're evaluating these things? Uh, it's if it's really hairy, they'll draw out the diagram. If you're, if, you're, if you're coding something particularly hairy, yeah, they'll draw out the diagram. Um, this sort of thing, this flip, flap, flip, flap, flip, where you do multiple applications of it through different procedure names, is in some sense an artificial example, right? In a lot of senses, an artificial example. Um, people probably wouldn't be coding something exactly like this. But certainly, if, if it's hairy and they're, they're coding something like this, then you certainly would draw out the diagram. You could just get lost in a big program. Right. And in fact, if you're drawing the diagram, you know, people might simplify it to some, you know, may, may not draw this frame. They may just try to keep track of this frame here. You know, because once. You know, they're using it to model it, but they know if the frame's just going to go away right away, it's not worth drawing. Yep. One, one, if what Neil was saying, so E9 and E10, according to John's convention, would be labeled like flap 2 and... Oh, sorry, did I stop one. doing that? Okay, I figured... So this is actually flip yeah. 1. Yeah, and then the other one is... Uh, there's flap 2, I think. Yeah. No, this can't be flap 2. No, this has to be flip, flip 1. Flip they're both flip 1. Okay. How would you, on a big program, so you have all those flip ones, how would you keep track of them? Keep, have, keep track of what? They're labeled flip one, flip one, flip one. And if I come back to this two weeks from now and I see three flip ones, it'd be. Well, you can you can follow these numbers to see what order they were applied in. So if you had the code that went with it and you had these frame numbers, that's why I actually like to number my frames because it gives me this sense of this you know t sense of time. Mm -hmm. Which if you just draw the frames, you have no sense of time. Especially since you know some of my frames I went off this way and some of my frames I came off this way. So even just the ordering of the frames doesn't give us a sense of the time. Right. Yeah. So you can't just look at the code and tell this. It certainly depends on your experience. I mean, certainly, you know, if you've done a lot of scheme coding, you can look at stuff and tell what it's going to do. It's pretty easy if you just have one indented program in front of it that it scopes up. But if right. you have all kinds of those. Right. Yeah, I mean, it just depends on people's level of experience and their comfort with it. And if it's really complicated, they'd probably draw a diagram out. Now, the number of people actually coding in scheme is probably quite small. But, I mean, I have friends writing, you know, search engine and Lisp. So there's certainly yeah, stuff being done. Yeah, for uh, flights. Yeah. For airlines, yeah. That's like the natural language? Uh, for the search they're doing, actually, they're getting a lot more power than any of the existing sites out there. See this? I'm giving you a plug. <laughs> <laughs> the name of the company is. No. <laughs> I want stock options, man. Uh, they haven't gone public yet. This looks just like this, right? Lisp is very similar. It's not tail recursive. Is that for the language? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, Lisp just has, because of the Lisp processing, it just makes it more powerful as an AI language, and the people who are writing it were coming out of the AI lab and just went with it. Does, does the Lisp there using have more special forms than this dialogue? No? I don't think so. Really? It's just such a compact little network scheme. Yeah. So, okay. Enough plugging the friends. Do you guys want to see any more on this, or should we move on to the one from the exam? Exam. Okay. Do you guys have your exams with you by chance, or no? I'll write the code up on the board. We'll write everything up on the board. For me, it's also helping me to understand these environmental diagrams now that we're working with the metacircle mm -hmm. evaluator to 
to see how that relatively small chunk of code actually constructs the ABCs by the It's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel all warm and fuzzy inside now. OK, let me write up the code. Because all of you don't have your exams, right? OK, let's write it up. I'm going to define make soda to have a name. Take parameters name, num in fridge, num in cabinet, sugar and caffeine. If you want to have fun, ask John how to spell caffeine. <laughs> So let's soda. Actually, it wasn't corrected on this one, right? Yeah. He did the environment diagram. Part. Yes. Okay, let's soda be a list of those five things. The name. Actually, can I just write NIF? Yeah. NIC, sugar, and caffeine. One, two, three. Lambda M. And then we had cond, eq, m, name. Would that be to write out all of the code here? Or if we got into enough code, that's OK? Yeah. So if we create our environment diagram, global environment. OK, so let's evaluate make soda. Let's, let's call. Let's define make soda. So make soda is a name that's going to get bound in our global environment. And what will it be bound to? Procedure object. Where am I evaluating this? And the parameters are? All those things. All those things. Yeah, great. <laughs> name, num in fridge, num in cabinet, sugar, and caffeine. Yes. And the body is? Let. Let. So blah, blah, blah. <laughs> OK. Bound. That's it. That's make soda. So now we're going to define make inventory. Dot sodas, sodas. Okay, just a brief notice, comment. Why did we not just say define make inventory list? Because then we didn't have a nice convenient procedure object to make you guys point to. This is why we did it this way. This, this way we could actually get a procedure object. Otherwise, you'd be pointing to the scheme primitive for list. So this is just an easier way to do it for the environment diagram. Okay, so we have make inventory. And make inventory is bound to be a procedure object pointing here. The parameters are sodas and the body sodas. Make inventory is bound to that. Check. So now we're going to define a small inventory. Define a small inventory to be make inventory with two items, make soda, Coke, 20, 30, yes, yes, and make soda, Diet Coke, 15, 17, no, yes. OK, yes? I just have a question on that prior line, define make inventory that Yep. Remember, the dot means that the arguments after are optional. OK, but, but then why is, it, why is there in a paren and then there's sodas again? I mean, what's, what, if you what leave 
because what this says is whatever parameters are passed, make a list of them. So then I'm just going to return the list. No, so with make inventory here, we're calling it, we're passing it two things. We're applying make inventory to two parameters. Okay. So these two parameters here will be made into a list, sodas. And then we return that list. The dot is what's making the list for us. This is a procedure that's being applied. This is a procedure that's being applied, and each of these is going to return a procedure object. Right? And those two procedure objects that are returned will be put into a list. It's called sodas only when we're scoped inside this procedure. And then it will return that. So it will return a pointer to that list. It's not going to return a pointer to the name. So That's a list. We'll go through. As we do this, you'll see how it comes out in the environment diagram. Is that dot like a sugared version of, of something? <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's in some sense you can sort of think of it as like a special form of sorts, right? Okay. Because anything after the dot will be put into a list. So if make inventory were called with no parameters, sodas would be set to nil and we would return the empty list here. Uh, if there were two sodas, we'd have a list of two sodas. If there were four sodas, we'd have a list of four sodas, five sodas. Um, and something exactly like this was on the solutions to quiz two. Right. There were a couple of ways that you could have defined the inventory for books way back on quiz two a whole week ago. Um, and you could have either found it to be list or you could have done it this way. OK, so we're going to define a small inventory. So small inventory is going to be bound to whatever is returned from this. But in order to apply make inventory, we need to evaluate these two. So we need to, let's first evaluate this, make soda, Coke, 20, 30, yes, yes. So we're going to be applying the procedure make soda. Applying a procedure. And here I can write make soda. I can put the parameters here to clue us into as to which call created that. But the parameter is going to be inside here anyway, and it's going to give it away for us anyway. So make soda, the procedure object points here, so I will point here, and there are five parameters. Name, num in fridge, num in cabinet, sugar, and caffeine. And we're calling it with the symbol Coke. 20, 20. yes, yes. 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 OK. So there's the frame that's created. And the body is to let. Uh, let has an implicit lambda, so it's an application. Points up to where we were evaluating in. So we're going to let E2. And here in this let, we're going to let soda. And so it is going to be a list of name, num and fridge, num and cabinet. The soda is going to be bound to a list of five items. Where the first is Coke, the second is 20. Because we're here, we're putting in the list the name. So we look up the name here, goes over. We hear the num in the fridge, look it up, goes over. 30, yes, yes. Okay. So that's the body of the let. And now we have a lambda. So we're going to create a procedure object. We're evaluating it under frame E2. The parameters are M for message, and the body is our cons for dispatching. So this is the final thing that's returned from make soda. Right? So this is our first make soda. What I'd like to do, since I'm not ready to put that in the list yet, it let me just put this here to remember that that's where we're going to go because we actually don't have anything to point to it yet. 
That was just the evaluation of make soda. Remember, we, we've just evaluated make soda. We haven't been able to apply make inventory yet. So we don't have that list. So I'm just going to put a little star there to remember that that's where what was returned, my return value. Yep. Where do you apply make soda before you define small inventory? Because I can't bind small inventory to anything yet because I don't have something to bind it to. I could write the name up in the environment, but I don't have anything to draw the arrow to yet. And similarly, I don't have anything that I can apply make inventory to until I evaluate these arguments. So that was the first one. So that's my star for the first. And now we're going to evaluate make soda on the Diet Coke. So we're evaluating make soda again. Creating E3, make soda. This procedure object points up to the global environment. And we need to bind some parameters. Name, num in fridge, num in cabinet, sugar and caffeine. So the name is Diet Coke. Num in fridge is 15, 17. No, yes. Okay. So now we bound the parameters. The body is to the let. So let's create another frame, which will be our let. It's going to point over here. I ran out of a little bit of board space here, so I had to move over to the side. So here's the let, and the parameters to be bound within, well, my let frame are soda. And soda is bound to be a list of five objects, which if I planned my space a little bit better, I'd be better off. And put that down here. One, two, three. With the first being Diet Coke, 15, 7, no, yes. And then I return soda. Well, no, I haven't got that yet. Sorry. We need to create, evaluate the lambda. So that's the let. Then we have a lambda. With the parameter message and the body, which is the cond. And this here which we can draw as an asterisk, is what's going to be returned from this. Now, I can apply make inventory to those two things that I've evaluated. So I'm going to apply make inventory, creating frame number E5. Make inventory is this procedure object here points to the global environment. It has one parameter, SOTUS. Okay. So looking back here, its parameter is the dotted notation, which means it's going to make a list of its two arguments here. If it was three, it would make a list of three things. If it was four, it would make a list of four things. So sodas is going to be a list of two things, with the first being star. And the second being asterisk. And then we return sodas, which is finally where we get to bind small inventory to sodas. Well, it gets bound to what sodas is bound to. Sodas is bound to this list, so we point to the list. Do you want me to read something? Or? Yeah, that's right. Print is getting a little small on the far side. Yep. And that's it. Yes. So we know that um, the DAW operator, and before the argument, 
Mm -hmm. It doesn't just, is this correct? It doesn't just mean the arguments are um, optional, but it means it's, it's forming the list. It creates a list of the optional arguments. Okay. All right. Because it has to do something with them, because it's only got one name, and it might have 0, 1, 2, 5, 10. So what it does is it makes it into a list. And that's why, if you recall, in some of the problem sets, we've had to use apply. Because we get our arguments in as a list, and we had to use apply to put the procedure over that list yep, to break it back out. Okay. So this is what's making the list. Okay. So if we look at the partial environment diagram. Now, we can just, they're all labeled different things. Actually, now that you guys understand it, it you could reconstruct the exam. Um, the only thing about grading on the exam is there were some dependencies. So these two procedures here and this one could have been swapped. But depending on whether, so one of these was P2 and one was P1. Um, but depending on which ones you had written, which slot, it would actually matter which frame you were pointing it to. Because you had to point it up. If you said that P1 was the first one, then you would better point to the environment that has Coke in it. If you said P2 was the first one, then it had to point to the environment that had Coke in it. So there was a slight dependency there. <coughs> Do you guys have any more questions on environment diagrams? Just on the format of the question, I found it confusing just initially to read it, have everything like this label, you know, like E4 and arbitrarily assigned. It just like set me back. Mm. Right, we have the object numbers have no relation to the order in which they were created, yeah. Yeah. I noticed when I was taking some of the practice exams, and this really started helping me a lot on this exam, was actually to draw out my own yeah. diagram, uh, or at least start okay. doing that, yeah. and then the rest kind of falls into place, because I think it's really confusing to just look at this and go, oh, yeah, okay, let's go. Yeah, yeah. Actually, right, it does. Because actually, I designed this question. I broke up those pieces of that, and when I needed to write the solutions to it, it still took me three to four minutes to look at it to figure out where everything hooked up. And it was a dependency that I was going, I would draw it out. Right, and then you have to coordinate the pieces. I think that's the better way to do it. I think it would be the easier way to do it. That's what I did I in my environment that model. Huh? I wish you gave us that hand on Draw your own model, then do it back, yeah. That's one way to do it, too. Or hand out scissors. Scissors would be cool. There you go. Hey, you Although I don't know, handing students in the middle of an exam <laughs> sharp objects. Safety, safety scissors. Safety scissors, yeah. Here's some blunt tip scissors. <laughs> cool. Safety scissors. Yeah. So, so while we're here, actually, I want to make sure that environment diagrams. I mean, environment model is is a big thing. Do you guys have any more questions on that? I mean, this is this is one of the key concepts coming out of this class. Yes. Um, how do things? Are there certain things that happen to the environment diagram? The environment model remains completely the same, okay. whether we're doing object-oriented programming or whether we're doing straight scheme programming. The only thing that was changing is that we had, basically, in the environment and the game, if you had a procedure object like this, this let here pointed off to another procedure object. Right. That was the inheritance. That's, so that's right. kind of the main. Usually with object-oriented, um, you have some notion of inheritance. The message passing, some people would call object-oriented. So if we do any sort of message passing, which we're doing here in this procedure, some people would call messages to get to do something. Um, but there is no inheritance in this particular type here. So, so either way, some object, because it's an object. We're object-oriented right here. We have no inheritance. So you can think of this object-oriented, or you could have object-oriented with inheritance, which is what we had in the game. And with that one, we ended up having three different levels and connecting them with our LEDs to one LED. Right, so, right, so basically if you had a, uh, we could do one, except I don't have the code in front of me. <laughs> well, that's okay. I, was just, I mean, that was pretty much giving us the inheritance right there. Right, so effectively, we would end up, if you had some global environment. <coughs> and we had make object, uh, rather, make named object, right? And it took in a name, and it had some body. And then we had a make mobile object, 
and this took in a name and a location, I believe. <laughs> and then some body. So then the bodies here, this one had a let in it. And this was just returning. It's really hard to do this without the code. But if we were making a, ma a mobile object, effectively what would happen is here we would have a named object in our let. We would get a procedure here that would be bound to say holly. And then here we would create a frame to apply it. And actually there was another frame in between here, right? And this would be where we would have the name, which would be holly. Like that. This is really hard to do without the code. When we call Holly here, if we don't find something in the body, then we can chain up here and look over at this procedure object. That's the inheritance coming out. That's how we're inheriting. We have one procedure object. If it doesn't find it, looking up the chain over to something else that it's inheriting from. And we could also have another, you know, something else here that pointed to another one like this. So it was this chaining that got us the inheritance. But they were objects like this. They were procedure objects. And then they inherited from other procedure objects. Was it, um, with something like that, there's always you know, two frames and then procedure. Is that pretty possible to have any number of frames? It depends on how we write the code. Right. We get a frame and we apply it. We get a frame for a let. If we had multiple lets, you could have multiple frames. Right. right? And actually, that's how, if you have a let, we did this example once. So we had let A be 1 and B be 2. And then we tried, well, B be plus 2A. And then we try to add A and B. If A were scoped in the external environment, it would need to, otherwise we'd get an error. So here, A and B are being bound in the let box, and this can't scope this A. So one way we could write that would be let A be 1, and then do a nested let B be plus 2A. So here we're creating additional frames. All right, so then we have a let pointing to a let frame. So we can write code that will create any number of frames if you'd like. I could write you code that would chain out eight or nine frames. You just do some nesting of luts. OK, um, just, just one last thing. Uh, with, on problem one, we had a uh, make person make the object and make named object. And make named object didn't have a let. Uh, and then there was the right, because na na named object was the simplest thing. Right. I'm just wondering if that's necessary, that we go simpler up the, up the chain that way. Right. So it was one and two frames and three frames for our most complex. complex. Uh, this is the make person. Uh, make person should have been a frame for when you bound the person's location and the name. And then it had a let frame to make it for the mobile object that went off to that. Mm -hmm. And then it was here. The only one that, so most of them should have had two. Okay. They should have two. The only one that didn't have two would have been the named object, because that was basically our base case. That was our ground out there. So we didn't have a let for the named object. So if we got to a named object, we didn't, the only method a named object has is name. So when we get to a name object, we're asking to do anything other than name. It means that that method doesn't exist for the type of thing we were using. So the base case is going to have no lets. The other ones can have any number of lets, depending on. Well, effectively, yeah, I guess I would think of it that way. So basically, your, your most general thing in the model, if it's not going to inherit from anything else, there's probably, there could be a let for other things. But there's not going to be a let with a procedure object being pointed to, because we're not going to inherit from anything else. That's it. That's the end. 
So if we drew the inheritance model as diagram for it. Here, we can do object-oriented right now. Ow, 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 ow. So at the top, we had a named object, which had the method name. And it is another class called, uh, not make, but a mobile object. with methods, location, I don't remember off the top of my head, but there were very messages we could pass to it. And then we had a person who was a mobile object with some number of messages that we could pass to it. Hmm? Things also. Things were mobile objects, yes. We had thing, which here. And I believe that the troll was the type of person, type yep. Of person. <clears throat> With its method, act, in which it crushed Holly and ate her up mercilessly. <laughs> Poor Holly. And then we also had locations, which were named objects. And then we had ID cards, which were things. That's the inheritance diagram for our system that we had. When a person changes location, where is that tracked? Where do you keep track of the There's two line? things, actually, which is why we need to do a make and install. Because the person needs to have their location in their chain updated, right? So the person has some let state that keeps track of where they are. That needs to be changed. But we also need to change at the location their list of what's there the list for the location of what's there. So that's why when we ask the location what they see, what it sees, it's going to look at that list of things in the location. This is an environment diagram, so it's sort of weird to talk about <laughs> pointing like that. But basically, the location has a list of things there. So when you say, what do you see? You'll say, I see problem set chalk, blah, 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 blah. Um, so the location needs to be updated when something moves in or out. And the person or the object that's being moved needs to be updated on moving in or out. Right. Because a thing needs to know where it is. If it's a mobile object, it needs to know where it is. And a location needs to know what's there. So those are the two things that have to be updated if something's moved. That's how we did a make and install person, make and install ID card, make and install mobile object. Because that install is what told the location it was there. So when this game runs, it just changes this, the constructions of what's in these lists. Right, effectively there are all these let boxes, right? There's all these frames created by lets that have variables bound inside of them yeah. that are being set banged. Who has what? Yeah, who has what and where and what. Yep. Exactly. Other questions? <laughs>